But this year, the theme, very appropriate one for California, I believe, is extending the vision, reaching every victim. Reaching every victim. That's what we're all about. We have been a national leader in the delivery of victim services since the inception of this program in 1965. We are known nationally for the fine work that we do. We are upheld as a model. And it's because of these wonderful partnerships that we have that we are able to protect victims' rights and deliver the services that they so desperately need in their time of tragedy. The governor recently sent a letter in honor of California Crime Victims' Rights Month, and I'd like to share just a short excerpt with you from that letter from Governor Brown. And I quote, the occasion of California Crime Victims' Rights Month is an opportunity to recognize and give our thanks to all of those who work to preserve and promote crime victims' rights and to let crime victims know that California is committed to supporting, to supporting them in their journeys to recover and justice. And, and on behalf of my colleagues in the legislature, 80 members in the Assembly, 40 members in the Senate, said how much we understand the importance of supporting you and supporting future victims of crime and know that the most important thing we can do is what we can to eliminate uh, the need for Victims Bureau because we need to eliminate um, the crime that's rampant in our society. Uh, but I didn't want to let this observance go by without the opportunity to tell you that we are with you, we got your backs, and anything we can do to help, we will. Thank you all so much. Every day, we prosecutors, district attorneys, this is our passion. This is what we do. This is what I think about every day when I get up in the morning. What are we going to do to protect the dignity of victims and victims' families? In 2004, then, Governor Schwarzenegger, as I kept hammering him about victims' rights, appointed me to the Victims' Compensation Board. And I'll tell you what, it's been an honor to work with the staff here. Tremendous work. You talk about awareness and getting the word and touching more victims. We lead the state. We lead the nation. You're going to hear from victims' families. I don't pretend to step in their shoes, and I never will. But one thing I learned about them, they're survivors. In 2004, I talked to the family members from California of 9-11, and they taught me that lesson. Mike, we're not victims anymore. We're survivors. You have to be to get through this. One of the themes that I hear almost universally from victims and survivors of crime is that is they want to be treated with uh, the dignity and they want to be heard. They want, to, they want leaders to understand, to listen, to see things from their point of view. And so I know that, that District Attorney Ramos and the Assembly member and my fellow colleagues and the Governor's uh, Cabinet, uh, the Victims' Compensation Board, they do that. Secondly, they, they're concerned about ensuring that there's restitution, that there's, uh, there's some consequence to, to this loss. And uh, I'm proud of the work that our, has uh, come from our partnership with the uh, Victims' Compensation Board. The last point is, it's, it's one thing to be heard, it's another to, to make sure that there's fair and just um, restitution, but the most important thing is that if this not happened to anybody else. And on behalf of the California Emergency Management Agency, and specifically those who work in our victim services program, it's a privilege to be here today to honor it, the strength and the voice of the victims that are going to share their stories with us. Those are the stories that provide our team the inspiration, the strength, the motivation, and the dedication and the compassion that our staff has in serving the victims of crime and their families. It is now my honor and my privilege to introduce to you um, victim family uh, members who have been so gracious to accept our invitation to join us here today as we commemorate this important uh, week. My brother Javier Angel was seven years old when he was murdered on Saturday, December 2nd, 1978. I was only 12 years old. My brother's body was found under Julia Diaz's bed. Apparently, she wanted financial gain. This last year, I finally took the steps to have therapy provided by the Victims Witness Assistant Program. By attending these sessions, it helps to cope with this horrible memory 
that I've, I have had for 33 years. My husband and I have fought this battle our entire adult lives. Our family has never been the same again, but we are the proof that you do move forward. I suggest to anyone that has been impacted by a crime to utilize the services offered because they have been put into place for our well-being. I have never forgotten my brother and I never will forget this horrible crime. All I can do is take the steps towards healing. I met Sandra when she was two years old. I went to go meet my husband's family for the first time and I was very nervous. <laughs> She came running to me with open arms and said, Hi, my name's Sandra. What's yours? I told her what my name was and picked her up. She loved to be held. She sat in my lap that afternoon, and she was so close to me that her forehead touched mine. And I tilted my head back and forth so our eyes would teeter-totter. After that moment, every time I saw her, she would come up to me and say, Do that thing. <laughs> I will never forget Friday, March 27th, 2009. That was the day that my husband's father called us on the phone to let us know that Sandra had gone missing. Nine days would go by before we would find her. Um, I prayed every day to God to help find her and get her home. Unfortunately, she was found, murdered, raped, and stuffed in a suitcase. Victim Services was there to help us along the way. They were there to help guide us, to counsel us, to be there when we were at our most vulnerable. At the age of eight, my uncle molested me, and I told my mother, and she told me I couldn't tell anyone because it would break up the family. So what I feel is, is I lived my first half of my life as a victim being re-victimized many times throughout my life and not even knowing it, thinking that I was wrong, I was a mistake, it was my fault. And then on April 4th of 2002, 10 years ago, my personal trainer from 24 Hour Fitness came into my house, drugged me, wrapped my face and head in saran wrap with a towel, trying to suffocate me to death, threatening to kill my son. But God truly gave me a gift and a blessing to know that at eight it was not my fault, and April 4th was not my fault, and I am no longer a victim. I am a survivor that is empowered to live into my community and put community above myself, to have started an organization, Crime Survivors, that now works every single day throughout Southern California to give victims their rights under Marcy's Law, to work with other wonderful organizations that are here today and our elected officials and our government entities and other nonprofits. Because what I believe is numbers are strength. When we unite together, we empower our communities to bring awareness, prevention, and then we empower victims to know that there are services throughout our nations that can help them with counseling and therapy and relocation and reimbursement so that they don't have to live off of their savings like that I did. Women that have experienced what I have usually stay silent as they are too afraid to come forward. What happened to me is not uncommon and could happen to anyone. Throughout the trial process, I felt that my morals had been in question when in fact I was the one grieving over many losses. Dropped from a second story balcony, drugged to the parking lot, shoved under my truck and told not to cry out for help. Then picked up, taken back upstairs and tortured for 13 hours and finally rescued. My wounds lie deeper than what is visible to the eye. A broken back in pelvis in six places now held together with three very long rods. They will never be removed. My left arm and elbow, shattered beyond almost repair, have been reconstructed with only partial movement, with titanium plates, screws, and an artificial joint. For four long months in a hospital and a nursing facility, bedridden, not knowing if I would ever walk again, finally to a wheelchair, and then to rehabilitation, and finally walking again. Once, I rele once released, I plugged into all resources that are available to us and have experienced incredibly wonderful and great healing. So I hope to participate in bridging the gap between the abused and the resources available that can save their lives. And most important, 
absolutely most important is those defining moments of compassionate, non-judgmental human connection that we all need to save a life and make it count. So please reach out. This is not about my story. My rape is merely one of millions. Most stories remain untold. And as a result, the victims of these crimes hold these traumas within themselves throughout their lives. So today I speak for all victims of rape and crime worldwide. I hope to assist in inspiring other victims to come forward with their stories so that we together can break the stigma attached with the word rape in our society. My story was thrown upon me. I did not choose it, as no victim does. Rape found me. On May 26 of 2010, I saw the devil emerge in the body of a stranger. I was waiting for a ride from my cousin Katie when I noticed a strange man following me from behind. I got back on my phone and told her about this. We became nervous and decided to remain on the line with each other until she got to where I was located because we both felt a sense of danger. I heard footsteps running fast behind me and before I could even shout out the street name itself, I was being tackled from behind by a man twice my size. On the other end of the phone, my cousin heard my scream and the cell phone crashed to the ground and she was cursed to hear the struggle while this man attacked me and as I fought for my life. Then the phone cut out. At one point, right before drifting out, he said to me, I'm sorry I have to do this. You're such a pretty girl. He was strangling me so tightly I could not scream for help or even plead with him to spare my life. This wasn't about sex at all. This was about power. This was about evil. This was about control. He ripped my purple rosary my mom had given me off my neck in order to get a better grip. The beads flung everywhere and his hands squeezed violently around my throat. I felt my limbs go numb and lifeless and everything went black and I lost consciousness. This man didn't even know my name. Would I forever remain nameless to him? After all my dreams of travel, this is what it had come down to, dying in the dark, far away from everyone I loved and at the hands of a stranger. You're told that before you die, you feel peace or a sense of calm but not for me. All I thought about was how my family and my mother specifically would find my dead, naked, raped, and beaten body here on the side of some abandoned building near rail railroad tracks. My eyes slowly opened. I was still in the mud. He was still there, hovering over my body. I kept screaming though, which I believe scared him because he looked around and began walking fast down the dark street. I kept screaming for help as I watched his white, dirt-stained t-shirt fade into the darkness. After getting help, I was taken to the hospital. For nearly 10 hours, people went over my body like a corpse, calling out measurements of scratches and bruises to enter into the computer. It felt as if they were performing an autopsy. They even took pictures of every inch of my battered and bruised body, which was humiliating, especially while feeling so ugly and, and insecure after what he had just done to me. My entire face and neck were covered with popped blood vessels, and the veins were broken in both of my eyes, making them blood red. I want all victims to know that no matter how alone and isolated society makes you feel after something so traumatic, please remember that you are far from alone. The number of women raped is staggering, and if only more came forward, the topic would no longer be taboo. Victims often say things like, I am scarred for life. I have said those words more than once, but I think that what, but think about what that really means. A scar is a wound that is now healed. It is a healed place. It is a marker and a reminder of what was formerly a wound, but is transformed into a new protected growth, almost a shield. There's a quote by Carl Jung that I want to end with. I am not what happens to me. I choose who I become. Thank you.